Good morning. Okay, what I'm going to share with you right now, some of you may not like what I'm going to say, but it's the truth. God loves Israel. Those are his people, but he's frustrated with them. He is so frustrated with them because they refuse to obey him and they refuse to receive his son as the Messiah. Not only that, they crucified him. You know, if, I, if you go back in history and you study the nation of Israel, there hasn't been a lot of Hebrews or Jews that have been obedient to God. Okay? It's their own fault that they are in this scenario in Israel right now with Hamas. That should have never happened. It's their own fault that they were the spears for 2,000 years and they ended up in the Holocaust. It's their own fault that they were set into captivity numerous of times. It's their own fault that God had to send major and minor prophets to them over and over and over to get them to come back, to obey Him. Okay? Let's face it, Jew Jewish people are not the most uh, endearing people. They're known for being greedy, stingy, and extremely arrogant, so much so that they claim salvation just based on heritage. God rightly said, these are an obstinate people. The Apostle Paul said the same thing in the New Testament. It's very difficult for a Jewish person to come to Christ and to recognize he's the Savior. But once they do, God can really use them. Now, God loves all his people, but he's frustrated, so frustrated. Look what they did to Jesus when he came on the scene. Okay, let me just show you a few things. Okay, Jesus came as a servant. They weren't expecting that. They were expecting the Messiah to come as a king with an entourage and on a chariot and flowing political kingdom and everything. But to be born of a manger from a lowly virgin girl named Mary and a carpenter, Joseph, they couldn't visualize that. They couldn't get their, their arrogance and their self-conceitedness blinded them from the truth. He, Jesus came as a servant. He says, I didn't come to serve, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. They didn't reject him. Look at what they did. Look at what they did in Matthew, which is what we're going to be talking about here, because Jesus is going to introduce them to a number of parables which are designed to keep the unbelieving Jews in blindness, yet reveal mysteries to the believing Jews, which few they wore, and to the Gentiles. Okay? They reject John the Baptist. What happened to him? They not only reject him, they, uh, uh, they ended up cutting his head off on a silver, and, and presented it to the emperor on a silver platter. He was rejected by his generation. He was rejected in the towns of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Read it. Go read it in Matthew chapter 12, what they did. They attacked Jesus. Here Jesus is doing a good thing. Oh, he did it on the Sabbath. <laughs> How about working on the Sabbath? They totally, and even a lot of Christians today, they go into these messianic temples and claiming to be something special. They are so, so misled. They don't understand the Sabbath at all. The Sabbath was never meant for man to be under the Sabbath. The Sabbath was given just to give man a day of rest. But even on that day of rest, with some logical reason, if you're 
or cow or whatever fell in a ditch, she'd go and get it out. You know, they were so mad that here you have this person, this figure, they were mad at Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. They put a rule and a law over and above common sense and goodness and kindness and love. A lot of Christians do that too. They're called legalists. Okay? They uh, eventually then began to conspire to kill Jesus, trying to come up with all kind of plots, how we can kill him. Uh, <laughs> can you imagine plotting to kill God? I mean, I, I sit and think about some of these things that the Jewish people did, and, and I'm just utterly amazed. I'm so glad there's, there's a number of passages in the New Testament. One of them is found in Acts 13, 46. Another one's found in Romans 11 and 11. Go and read it. You know, one thing God says is, you know what? I'm going to go to the Gentiles. I'm going to go to them so that I can make the Jewish people jealous. You have a wife or a husband, and they're over there flirting with somebody else. So you decide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get me somebody, too, and make them jealous. Well, that's what God did. But only he didn't just intend to do it. He did it. And he brought on the Gentiles. Are the Gentiles less than Jews? Absolutely not. That is so stupid to even think that. We're all created in the image of God. He just chose those people to bring through a certain order and a law and to make so that they could reveal who he was, not who they were. If anything, he picked the lowest of ethnic groups in order to communicate he was. Because if a Jewish person as messed up as they are can communicate God, then, then people are really going to come to God. I know some Jewish people that have been converted, and they are amazing evangelists. Okay, but they understand the basic anthropological idea of what people are. You know, so another passage, and I think it's in Romans 11, where Paul is telling, hey, you know what, you're so hostile, you're so brain dead, you're so obstinate, I'm going to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Even Peter had a hard time accepting that idea, you know. And God had to tell him, hey, Peter, what I made clean, don't make dirty. Okay, people get these ideas in their heads about life and God and people and they run amok with it in insanity with no common sense or common decency. Well, these Jews have been doing this for thousands of years. It was finally came to where you read Malachi to John the Baptist 400 years, God just quit talking to him. Why should I talk to you? You know, listen anyway. You ever say that to anybody? I have a number of people I'm talking to right now saying, you know what? Talking to you is like talking to the wall, okay? Because everything I say is just going in one ear and out the other. In fact, when it comes out, it comes out worse than what I had ever said and distort it. Oh, I have a lot of fun with this because it's so silly and stupid. And Christians are being so completely ignoramus when it comes to understanding God, who he is. His plan for people in the world, his church. And they make up so much incredible, superstitious and ridiculous legalistic nonsense. It isn't any wonder that God is so grieved at his own people and even now at the church, where the church is an apostasy. Let me go on. The Jews were expecting this. Okay, let me see this. See this. They saw prophecy. In the Old Testament, you have dual messianic prophecy. You see Jesus, or the Messiah, coming both as a king and as a servant. They didn't look at those passages as a servant. They just stayed to the wing of the king. So they were expecting the Messiah to come, and when he comes, 
to restore the kingdom to Israel. More in a political sense, you know, or in a state sense than in a spiritual sense. Okay? Actually, Jesus is going to restore the kingdom to Israel during the millennial as a fulfillment and a promise to Abraham and David. Okay? But they were expecting that. And so when Jesus came on the scene in Matthew, he's actually offering them himself to establish the kingdom. And as I read, look what they did. They utterly rejected him. You're not going to be the one to bring in the kingdom. We don't accept you. Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, carpenter's son. Nah, you don't fit the bill. It's often cases when churches or Christian organizations, they want to hire a pastor that has all these credentials and, you know, somebody that comes from a real fine family, you know. When you look at the disciples, they weren't, they weren't a lot of, you know, uh, VIPs among that group, okay? Nor if you looked at the people that God has really used, most of them were so-called outcasts, are the ones that actually turned to the Lord Jesus, huh? Mary Magdalene, huh? All the disciples, the various people, even in the Old Testament, that God used as prophets, you know, not a, and in First Corinthians says, "Hey, I haven't called a lot of noble, a lot of rich, a lot of educated, a few, not many." Okay, most of us are just ordinary, garden variety type people that have a belief in God. You know, it's not about us; it's about God. It's about how extraordinary He is, not extraordinary how we are. In this narcissistic age that we live in today, God is not looking for a person big enough. He's looking for a person small enough who can get over himself and allow God to come in his life, fill his heart, his spirit, so that he can minister through you, through me. Oh, people don't understand. So what does God do? They're expecting this. And... They were saying, even the disciples, just before Jesus rose uh, and ascended to heaven, said in Acts 1, hey, Jesus, is this the time when you're going to establish the kingdom to Israel? They still didn't get it. No! A mystery's coming in. The inter-advent that's going to happen as you see way down here. I don't know if you can see this. They rejected the Lord. Christ comes and he ascends. And then we are in a period of time called the inter-advent between when Jesus ascended and his second coming. Okay? During this time, judgment comes on Israel. That's what we're seeing. And blessings are coming to the Gentiles. You're a Christian running to a Jewish church, you're missing your blessing. Okay, your blessing is where you're at. Judgment is coming on Israel for their disobedience, for their rejection, for sending God, Jesus, to the cross. And blessings are coming to the Gentiles. Okay. Rejection by the nation of Israel, they finally come and they receive them. They finally get their eyes open and everything at the second coming of Christ. That's when the millennial begins. Now, so he's got to explain this now to the disciples. And what he does is use a series of parables. Parables come from the Greek word parabolo which means to throw alongside, to go alongside. It's to compare something. It's to take you from the, uh, from the known to the unknown, from truth to unknown truth. The unknown truth are the mysteries which we are in now. Okay? There was no understanding of this in the Old Testament. It wasn't talked about. 
It is in the New Testament. Okay. So what Jesus is going to do is he's going to usher in and begin to talk about a number of different parables. Okay. He wants to do that because he wants to reveal the truth to the believing, yet hide it from the unbelieving. Spiritual truth is only discernible by those that are born again. If you are not born again, you cannot understand spiritual truths because they're spiritually appraised. You have to be born again. You can have two people looking at the same item and they will come away with two different perspectives. Okay, one will see it as it is, one will see it as he imagines it is. Okay, which one do you want to be? You want to see truth as it is, life as it really is? You got to see it from God's vantage point. That's wisdom. And only God can give you those set of eyes. Why do you think David would pray all the time, Lord, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things. Search my heart that I may know if there's anything wicked in me. Okay, it has to be assisted by the Holy Spirit. It's called illumination. Okay, God is opening you to truth which would otherwise be unknown. And he's going to do this with parables. Okay, and the first parable he gives is the one of the sower. Matthew 13, 1 to 23. And he does this by emphasizing the soils. It's about a, you got, you've done it before, you got a garden, you got some seeds, you go out there and you throw it, you know, and some of it fell on the sidewalk, some of it fell on the curb, some of it fell in uh, weeds, and some of it fell in that soil that you cultivated and fertilized and everything. Well, you know the seed isn't going to come up the same in different types of, uh, of soil. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take root in the soil that can give it life. Okay, and the only soil that, can, that we have that can give us life is you abide in me and I abide in you. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the vine, right? The Father's the vine dresser with the branches. But you got to get soil into the right thing. What's he talking about here? This is where a lot of people miss it. You can kind of see it in two cents. He's talking about all this time here. To Israel, I was trying to introduce them to the kingdom. But they didn't get it. Because every time I would throw some the seeds to Israel, they wouldn't understand it or Satan would come and pluck it away. It ended up snatched away. Some of the seeds fell on rocky soil on Israel. And they were the ones that, oh man, get all excited. Look what we got. They're emotionally stirred people. Okay. Next day, all that emotion is gone. They quickly fall away. Some are on thorny, thorny. They're the warriors. What are we going to do for money? What's going to happen tomorrow? How are we going to get by? They're always caught up in all this. They don't understand the truth that God says that he would provide for his own. They can't settle in that. They're always worried. So what happens as a result of that? They end up become unfruitful. And then you have those that fall on fertile soil. They hear, and a key word if you see in, uh, oh, I'm not doing my Bible. Hold on one second. Don't get excited. <clears throat> I'm back. Is in uh, Matthew 13, and he says, he says to them, "How blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear." This is the fertile. Okay. I tell you the truth: many prophet and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, that's what he's talking about, okay, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away, what was sown in his heart. What was the key word there? Understand. They didn't understand. They didn't understand because their arrogance and self-imposed superiority got in the way. 
Does that ever happen to you? You think you're more than what you really are? Okay, that's why in Romans it says, let no man think of himself more than what he really is, but let him examine himself to see the truth. Okay, this is the seed sown along the path. What was sown on the rocky place is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. All the emotional, oh, you know, facade and all that type of person. That's why I go into some of these church rock and roll bands and contemporary music. They get all excited. You see them an hour later in the supermarket in the car, and they're all upset. And what happened? <laughs> it's fake. Okay. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away, you know. What was sown among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it. Well, hey, you know, Lord, I know I probably should support your ministry and work. But, you know, God, I got these bills to pay and this and that. And if I don't pay that, then I'm out of a job. I may have a house. And, uh, and, and what may happen tomorrow? And so they're all caught up and there's money and worries, and then how am I going to pay for this, and how am I pay for that? You know, Christians shouldn't talk like that, okay? No, we're all guilty of that, don't get me wrong. But we need to focus our attention on the fact that Matthew, earlier, Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things, the basic necessities of life, God will provide for you. But what was sown... On the good soil is the man who hears the word, and here again, hears and understands. He produced a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Simple, as we're going to go through the parables. This is what they were wanting, the Jews people, they were expecting Jesus to restore the kingdom. That's not going to happen now. Your opportunity is gone. I'm now bringing in an inter-advent of time uh, where I'm going to operate in a mysterious way. I'm going to bless the Gentiles and the Jewish people are going to be judged, which we have seen in history. And it will continue on all the way through the tribulation. Okay, until uh, Jesus established his millennial kingdom. So this I'm talking about Jesus says, I'm talking about this. You didn't get this kingdom. You didn't establish when I came on my earthly ministry because you were either beside the road, you were rocky, you were thorny, but like the disciples, you were fertile. Okay, now, and people ask me, well, isn't this the same process that you can use for evangelism? Of course, yeah. I want to go share the gospel which is what God wants us to do anyway. That's why Matthew says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. It's sowing the seeds. And when you sow, this is about the soil, this is the consequence. You're not responsible for the consequence. You don't need to be afraid of it. You don't need to be afraid of how they're going to respond. You just don't know what kind of soil you're going to throw that seed on. One of my professors at Dallas Seminary used to say, take the seeds and pretend that they're a matchstick. And out there among all land are all these 50-gallon drums. Take the matchsticks and start flinking them like you're throwing seeds. Some of those drums are going to be fertile. They're going to be filled with dynamite. And it's going to catch, and it's going to explode, and it's going to produce an explosion that's huge. That's what God wants us to do today. We are in the inter between Christ rising Ascending and his return. The Jews' opportunity to have the Messiah come as a king in this way, what's lost? 
that's not going to happen until after the tribulation. And right now, he's bringing judgment on Israel and blessings on Gentiles. Don't sell yourself short. Pay attention. Study to show yourself approved as a workman who need not be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Not all this stuff is easy. It's, it's not designed to be easy, and it's also designed to keep the truth from those that won't dig and won't spend the time in the Word. Okay, God bless you. Uh, we're going to continue with the series of parables. And you stay with me, you're going to learn some things. Okay, God bless you. Share this with other people. If you want to support this ministry, by all means, do it. Don't just think about it. God will bless you. Bye.